<laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you today about something as wonderful as food. Of course, we all enjoy food, uh, but more than that, it can be a very important tool for addressing our environmental concerns. So we all know that eating healthy food has a direct positive impact on us. We feel our best when we eat good food. But there's another pathway that's also really important. Um, sustainable food systems actually lead to a vibrant biosphere, which is also essential to our health and our well-being. To understand this, it's helpful to look at the opposite case. So eating less healthy food also has a direct impact on us. We don't feel our best when we're eating highly processed, addictive foods. And unsustainable food systems lead to a whole list of environmental challenges. Pictured here is just one, an unstable climate. And you might be asking, well, how do these things affect our health? There are many ways. So just this one way, uh, climate change, we'll look at that, impacts our health in a number of ways, including the extremes in heat, uh, poor water quality, changes in the range of vector-borne disease, um, and also flooding and emotional distress due to the more frequent and more powerful storms that we're now experiencing due to climate change. So let's delve into this relationship between our food systems and the environment. So unsustainable food systems can lead to a variety of impacts, including too much water use, too much land use, high rates of biodiversity loss, and high rates of antibiotic resistance proliferation. Um, 70 to 80 percent of the antibiotics we use today go to animals in factory farms just for growth promotion. There's also a lot of chemical pollution that has to do with agriculture. Um, and there are large disruptions of our nutrient cycles, which would be our nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. Shown here is a, is a section of the Gulf of Mexico that's without oxygen due to over-fertilization from nitrogen and phosphorus in agricultural runoff. And of course, we have climate change. Um, before we get to that, I wanted to spend a moment on water. So there's a term called hidden water, which means that we need to think about all of the water that goes into making a product. So let's think about that for a minute. Imagine a one liter bottle of soda. And you might imagine water goes into that to make the soda, even the packaging. Uh, can anybody guess how many liters of water would go into making that one liter of soda? The 10 is, the, is very often the first choice. Um, the actual footprint of one liter of soda is several hundred liters of water. It's hard to get our mind around that. That's a lot of water, of three to 600 liters of water. Surprising until we remember what's in soda, a lot of sweetener. Growing all that sweetener takes land and resources, including water. So that leads to the high water footprint. But what I'd like to focus on today is the carbon footprint of food choices, our impact on climate change. So we're in the midst of climate change right now due to the really dramatic increases in the concentration of greenhouse gases that in the atmosphere that have occurred over the last 100 years or so due to the Industrial Revolution and our rapid population growth. So all of the, these gases trap heat, and indeed we have seen a warming of the globe. Temperatures have, have gone up, and we've also seen a, a many other impacts that are undesirable. So how does food relate to all of this? Well, you can see from this bar chart that foods vary greatly in their carbon footprint. So you can see at the top of the chart, you've got potatoes, oatmeal, mushrooms, chickpeas. Um, at the bottom, you've got the poultry, pork, beef, lamb. So you may start to notice yourself some patterns coming out of these data. And one is that, in general, animal products do tend to have a higher carbon footprint. Um, and that makes sense, because whenever we grow anything, say we're growing food for us to eat, resources are involved in that. There's energy use, land, water, nitrogen, fertilizer uh, that go toward, toward that food. If instead we feed crops to animals, there's just a multiplier in the carbon footprint of the product that comes from the animal. Um, so that's what leads to the animal products tending toward the bottom. 
Um, you might also notice that two of the animal products shown here are higher than the others. So that would be beef and lamb. And that also, that's for a good reason, these particular animals, so cows, sheep, and goats, are all ruminants, which means that they produce methane as part of their natural digestion process. Methane is a more potent uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, so it gets counted in the carbon footprint with a multiplier. You may have noticed the units were grams of CO2 equivalent. So that for carbon footprint, it's reported that way because it incorporates all of the different greenhouse gases with multipliers if needed to account for their more potent nature. So what can we do with these numbers? You can actually do some very fun calculations with the numbers to calculate the carbon footprint of your favorite recipes. So what you see here in the large white numbers are the carbon footprints of the ingredients of a veggie burrito. On the top, you see beans, cooked veggies, see raw veggies, guacamole. Um, you might notice that the number for the beans is quite low. Um, and there's a really good reason for that. So beans can actually obtain their nitrogen from the atmosphere. The atmosphere is 80% nitrogen. And they can use that nitrogen because of the specialized bacteria that live in their root zone. Other types of plants require nitrogen fertilizer, which is very carbon intensive, leading to a higher carbon footprint. Um, so if we imagine this burrito, and then we imagine a second burrito with similar calories and protein, but we're going to switch out the top two items for beef, cheese, and sour cream. Let's look at what happens to the carbon footprint numbers when we do that. So you can see that even the small amount of cheese um, has a carbon footprint that overwhelms the entire veggie burrito. If you take into account the beef, the number is much, much higher. So what's shown here are two extreme cases, but you could see here, can't go all the way, portion size ratios of different ingredients can make a huge difference. So what we've been doing at UCLA is making educational materials like these infographics just to get the word out there. Uh, because what we've shown in a separate study is that just by learning about the connections between food and environment, people make choices that are both healthier for them and better for the planet. So it's really exciting. Um, we're seeing the role that education can play. Here are just some more examples. Uh, you could have a bean bowl that's around 250 uh, grams of CO2 equivalents. It's 10 times that for the beef chili. Um, here you can see if you wanted a creamy vegetable soup, if you use a traditional, if you use a dairy creamer, you have a much higher footprint than if you use a different ingredient, say cashews or potatoes, that will also give you creamy texture, but without the heavy carbon footprint. Also a, a recipe like pancakes. If you use a dairy alternative, you will cut the carbon footprint quite a bit. And it's not just ingredients. We need to take into account things like packaging, transport, refrigerated transport. Um, and so let's do that. Let's imagine we're making guacamole. So if we go to the store, we would notice that the avocados, limes, tomatoes, onions, and garlic are all stored at room temperature in the store. We might also notice that if we wanted to buy some store-bought guacamole, there would be packaging, so we would want to take that into account. And also, we would think about the fact that that guacamole package needed to be shipped to the store cold. So that requires uh, refrigerated transport, and it needs to be stored cold. So all of those factors combine to a doubling of the carbon footprint for essentially the same food. So if you want to do these calculations at home, this table makes it straightforward because the numbers are now given per serving. So you can see for one slice of cheese, one tablespoon of hummus, you can see the serving size and you can see the numbers. So many of you may be mentally making sandwiches in your heads right now. You can, so let's do that. Let's envision kind of a high carbon footprint example. So you can see here maybe a couple of slices of roast beef and cheese or a hamburger patty. We're going to be up around 3,000 grams of CO2 equivalents. If we look at the lower carbon footprint items, the hummus, the beans, I mean, we may see something like this. The PB&J is pretty low. 
Um, so we get a sense for these numbers. But what do these numbers mean? Most of us have no idea because we're not used to thinking in terms of grams of CO2 equivalents. So a really interesting way to put these numbers into context is actually to think about the Paris Climate Accord. So was anyone else here disappointed when the president announced his intent to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord? I see hands. Me too. Okay. Um, under that accord, the U.S. would commit to reducing our greenhouse gases by 447 million metric tons. That sounds like a really big number per year. Um, few of us could conceptualize what that means. But if we divide it by the population of the U.S., and the number of days in a year, we get 3,660 grams of CO2 per person per day. That's the equivalent of a sandwich, pretty much. Uh, so you can see that this number is actually achievable with simple changes in diet. Um, and if we're willing to go to more active transport, reduce consumption, increase conservation, um, then we can do even more. And so to end where we started, healthier food has, impacts us uh, directly and indirectly through a healthier planet. Thank you very much.